Those of you joining for the first time, welcome. The goal here on The Nest is to connect entrepreneurs in frontier markets with angel investors worldwide. We stream weekly on Thursdays during the lockdown and all episodes are recorded and available on our website, findthenest.org. Today we have three exciting companies, one from East Africa, another from West Africa, and one from North Africa, our very first entrepreneur presenting from Egypt. We also have two new business angels today, including our first female panelists, as well as the former Prime Minister of Haiti, and also a returning super angel from last week. We're gonna hear a little bit more about each of them in a minute, but first, let me cover some technical rules for today. So, oops. So as you notice, you are automatically muted when you enter the meeting. Please leave yourself muted unless you're speaking. But this does not mean that we don't want to hear from you. It's an interactive forum and we purposely left it open for questions and comments from all of you in the audience. So please use that chat box. Uh, make your comments, ask questions during the show. We'll make sure we relay what we can with the time that we have during the show. And of course, use that chat box if you want to make investments too. We've already seen a couple of investments from the previous weeks done through the chat box. So I encourage you to do so. Uh, in the meantime, please introduce yourself on the chat box, uh, your name, what you do, where you're from, uh, why you're here today. All right. Well, with that, I think uh, maybe we can launch a quick poll where everybody's from. And now we're ready to get on with the show. Well, let me introduce myself quickly first. My name is Jim Chu, and I am based in San Francisco, and I invest in startups worldwide. I run a social business for clean water in Haiti, and I also run Untapped, where we focus on supporting entrepreneurs in developing markets with technology and asset financing. Enough about me. Go on over to the angels. Laurent, would you like to start first? Thank you very much, Jim, and uh, and thank you to all the other angels and uh, and entrepreneurs. Uh, my name is Laurent Lamoth. I'm the former um, Prime Minister of Haiti, but before that, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I opened a, a telecommunications company um, right out of college called Global Voice Group that I founded, and it became one of the largest uh, uh, regulatory technology companies to regulators in Africa, operated in 42 countries in Africa. Um, and then I opened a series of other businesses, uh, a mobilization, online mobilization company for uh, elections. Um, and now my latest uh, venture is uh, called Our Ventures. And that's the purpose that, that I'm here today. But, but I want to also congratulate Jim uh, for, you know, you know, taking the chance and investing in my country, Haiti. And, uh, you know, it it's, can be a difficult business environment. And I thank you for giving us the opportunity and the chance to, to believe in the country and investing in it. So, and I'm glad to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And Gita. Uh, thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. My name is Geeta Dharmaratnam. Um, I'm the CEO and founding partner of Equalitas Capital Partners, which is a advisory business advising on impact investment and, and ESG. And uh, we're quite fresh off the ground. Uh, we actually launched towards the, the tail end of last year. Um, and, uh, you know, over the, the course of the last 14 or so years in my career in private equity in uh, focusing on Africa, but uh, also with engagement in Latin America, um, the Middle East and, and Asia, a couple of things which uh, became very clear is the private equity end of the spectrum um, is, is not gonna move very much further without seeing more VC activity, especially in Africa. I'm really glad to be here today. Great, thank you very much, welcome. And Raj, welcome back. Hey Jim, it's lovely to be back. I enjoyed the show so much, so thank you for inviting me back. Uh, unfortunately, I'm neither a prime minister nor a CEO. I'm just a lawyer and an angel investor. My day job, uh, I work at a law firm called Denton's, which is currently the largest law firm in the world. My night job, and in fact, the job that, um, that brings me here today is as an investor, an angel investor. I've made investments both in the UK 
and on the continent. I think my current portfolio, if includes um, slightly cheatingly include the startup bootcamp portfolio, is about sixty companies. Great, and and I understand too that you are um, on the board of a new um, seed fund for Africa, Launch Africa. Is that right? That's right. I'm an advisor to something called Launch Africa. Um, Zach and Janaid are the two uh, GPs, and along with Vishal and Falabi, we are actually looking for a, um, a fifth or sixth partner um, who uh, we are looking for someone who is uh, female, who hopefully has Francophone Africa um, and has some VC experience. Anyone who knows anyone uh, fitting that description, uh, I know I've already spoken to Geeta about that. Please um, contact me or, or Zach or Vishal. Great, thank you very much. And speaking of uh, female investors, uh, we will be having a show likely next week or the week after uh, with an all female uh, um, angel investor panel. So please come back uh, for that. And if you want to subscribe to our program, you can do so on our website to find the nest.org or also on our YouTube channel as well. So great, well with that, I'd like to now head over to the um, entrepreneurs. So, Abdulaziz, are you here? If you, you, might, you are, yeah. Hello, am, yes. am I audible enough? Yes, yes. I think so, but uh, okay. let's see. Oh, so, don't have uh, video on, I don't believe. Okay. Fine. So, can I please uh, uh, share my screen, or I, I just, yes, uh, it's, it's all it's all you. Now, really quickly on um, just some technical logistics, you have five minutes to present, and we are quite um, we are quite uh, strict on timing, so we will cut you off uh, when the time comes. Perfect. So, uh, is that is that uh, your, uh, your, is that uh, is, is is the presentation clear to everybody? I've just posted it. I've just shared it. Yes, it is. Can everyone? Perfect. It's fine. Uh, it's kind of blink, blinking at the top, it's but it's kind fine. Of glitching a little bit. Yeah. So if this problem persists, we might want to switch over to having one of us. No, experts. it's okay. It's okay. okay. Now, now it's good. Okay. Now, good. Now it's time. Well, let, me, let me just start. Uh, Jim, my name is Abdulaziz Omar. I am the founder and CEO of uh, a very exciting patented technology out of Kenya, East Africa, known as MPOST. MPOST basically stands for Mobile Post. And essentially, um, we, might, we may or we may not be aware that according to the United Nations, uh, over 4 billion people worldwide are considered unaddressed. Um, we basically had a system of a postal addressing system in almost every country, but most of those systems are actually inefficient very expensive and basically act as agents of exclusion because a lot of people kind of you know share the postal addresses. So our solution having realized this particular gap is extremely very simple and very practical. What we do is we basically provide a, a mobile postal, official mobile postal addresses by essentially converting a person's mobile number to become the official postal address. Uh, how it basically works is extremely very simple uh, through a seven to ten second process through the phone uh, The client is able to access our platform either using the USSP code the app or the webmail and uh, within seven seconds They're actually able to get their uh, MPOST addresses So whenever they ask for their address is basically the mobile phone the mobile phone and the uh, respective postal code and once and once um, and, and once they and, and, and once they, they basically uh, get the address, they're actually able to uh, you know, uh, use that address to, to access both public and private services. And once they have mail or um, parcel at the registered postal office, they get a notification and they're actually able to go to that post office to pick the mail or they're actually able to have it delivered at their place of their convenience. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to the next page. Um, hello, Jim. Yep, keep going. You're still there. Is, is, is the screen is the screen available to everybody? Yes, it is. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, what is the market validation? The market validation essentially is uh, we have over forty million plus mobile subscribers, especially in Kenya right now. Um, out of those forty million mobile uh, subscribers, uh, the postal authority in this country had only managed to provide only four hundred thousand uh, postal addresses. 
uh, through our technology, we currently have managed to do over 50% of what the Postal Corporation of Kenya has managed to do in 137 years. We've done this in less than three years. Uh, Jim, next page. Jim, yeah, so how we make our money? Uh, it's simple, basically, uh, we have subscription model uh, is our first aspect of uh, getting revenue. The second aspect is the notification informing the customers or the clients that they actually have mail or a parcel. The third is basically big data, uh, as, uh, big data analytics. And the fourth is basically delivery. And we're thinking of coming up uh, with a mobile wallet to basically act as a FinTech angle of the MPOST app platform. Uh, next page, Jim. <coughs> Uh, so what has been our impact so far? Uh, in the last three years of our existence, we have over 230,000 users. 53% uh, of our users are the youth. We have a direct impact, especially in terms of farmers, on a matter of end-to-end -end logistics. And through our platform, we have done over 200,000 plus deliveries. And very interestingly, uh, Jim, uh, of these 200,000 plus deliveries, 75% have essentially come through from Alibaba. Uh, basically, you know, uh, showing the essence of, you know, an address vis-a-vis -vis the growing e-commerce demand uh, in Africa. Next page. <clears throat> um, as you can see, that is basically how our um, impact has been uh, captured from a pictorial perspective. We can just go to the next two pages, please. In terms of value chain, as well as enhanced trade, in terms of giving people first mile, as well as the last mile aspect. Next page. Uh, in terms of our key metrics, uh, as I stated earlier, from a top line perspective, over 230,000 uh, registered users. Uh, out of those 230,000 registered users, almost 40,000 plus of them have been quite active. And through this, we have accumulated over 52,000 uh, US dollars just from one aspect of revenue, that is just the, uh, the registration revenue. Um, we have basically uh, opened our Series A and we're looking at raising 1.99 million US dollars. We have basically had over 842,000 raised so far. We are looking at breaking even in the next two years, uh, essentially at around 1.8 million customers. Uh, and we're basically asking uh, you know, uh, for the angels in this particular platform to try to contribute to, uh, between 10,000 and above uh, that will actually help us in achieving our business objective. I, I must add that we have uh, had very um, uh, interesting partnerships. Right now, we've basically partnered with uh, Safaricom, which is actually the largest, uh, uh, the largest uh, telecom uh, in Kenya, and we're partnering with one of the largest banks to basically provide addresses to their clientele. Um, contracts and accolades, we basically have a contract, an exclusive and uh, an ending contract with the Postal Corporation of Kenya. Our Technology is patented by ARIPO. We are recognized by the Universal Postal Union, as well as the uh, Postal Corporation of Uganda and the African Union. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for making it on time as well. So over to the angels. Questions, comments, observations, commitments. Abdulaziz, a question. Um, which countries are you looking to expand to beyond Kenya? Thank you, Gita. Uh, so essentially, we are looking at uh, uh, the immediate East African region, uh, Uganda, which already have a contract. Uh, next in line would be Rwanda, then uh, Tanzania and Ethiopia. Okay. And is the expectation, though, any level of that expansion is going to take place within the next two years? Yes, we're actually looking at covering the whole of East Africa within the next two years. So as I said before, we already have the contract with Uganda. It's simply a matter of executing it. And we're already on the tail end of having Rwanda on board. Okay. Oh, Laziz, good to see you again. Good to see you, Raj. We keep bumping into each other. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good to see you and, and well done for, for the traction you've got today. Um, the question I, the one question I had, so when we met last year in, in Nairobi with Vishal and, and Zach, um, when I think it was just, I think you were closing your last round when your valuation was about 2 million, your revenue was about 40,000, I think, cumulative revenue. And I yes, think I just... Um, and, 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 yes, and, and, and that was uh, the gross revenue. So you can actually see it's, it's grown substantially since then. <clears throat> So I, I couldn't see the slide, but I only saw the slide very quickly, but the, the cumulative revenue seemed to have gone from 40,000 to 53,000. Is that right? Right. So, so that's the total revenue that you've ever earned from day one, right? Right. So in a year, your revenue has increased by about $10,000. Right. Okay. So 
so how do you how do you go from a two million valuation to an eight million valuation when so, you've increased your revenue by ten thousand dollars? I'm just struggling to understand that. Yes, thank thank Raj. That's that's an extremely good question. And uh, essentially, uh, we're looking at uh, several aspects when it comes to valuation, and of course, it's at everybody's discretion. But then, essentially, apart from uh, the cash outlay, and remember, our cash, uh, sorry, uh, I mean our our um, our cash revenues. Uh, it's only based on one revenue uh, uh, platform or other source at the moment, which is basically the registration. Um, to, to, to basically be very practical, that has been accumulated uh, from basically last year, but 2018, almost December, because before then we were basically trying to build the technology. So this money has actually been made more or less in like two or so years. Uh, but then what gives our valuation a little bit uh, of, a, of, of, a, of a fatten, for, for lack of a better word, is not only the prospects of the market that we're dealing with, because we're looking at roughly in Africa, almost 99% of the people do not have addresses, which are very a critical uh, infrastructure on the aspects of e-commerce and also KYC. But also the fact that uh, we have a patent for this particular technology. And not only that, we basically have a non-ending contract, especially in the Republic of Kenya, to actually provide these formal official virtual postal addresses for the existence of our business. Okay, so I think what you're saying is it's very sticky because you've got you've got everyone's now got a post post office through your through your platform, and 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 then you can sell additional services. Is, is what you're right. saying, I think, right? But right. then how does it how does it work with other countries where you don't have a partnership with a post office? I presume that the countries that you're going into has Safaricom in it, so you you've got that that side covered. But how does it work when you don't have the post office covered? That's a beautiful question, Raj. Um, and essentially, that is why in one of our strategic advantages that I actually mentioned out there is the mere fact that we have been recognized by the Universal Postal Union, the Universal Postal okay. Union, UN body for postal addresses, or rather okay. postal corporations worldwide. And, you know, we basically have the 190 country membership. Okay. And, and but what does that give you? You, you? you get recognized, but that doesn't mean you get a contract, right? Yes, so essentially in terms of basically entry to market, uh, we, we, we actually have lifted that barrier. And right now what we're struggling with Raj is every country is calling us to get in. But you see, okay. we're not, we don't want to do that quite uh, quickly before we actually galvanize our home market. Okay. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, first of all, you know, I, I, I think there is a huge need um, in, in Africa in general for the, for the type of uh, of uh, services that you provide. So I see exactly, you know, a need for this and I see where you're going. I, I have um, a few concerns about the valuation and, and, and of course, you know, I mean, I think it's a little bit like, very aggressive. Um, now the question, the question that I have is the, the 1.8 million subscribers for you to break even, is that, are you planning on getting that only in Kenya or what, what are your projections for Uganda? And are you um, planning on going to countries such as, for example, Ghana and the French speaking Africa as well, such as Ivory Coast, uh, Senegal and, and, uh, and those countries? Um, and, and the other question is, that I have is, uh, what's your churn rate um, for the past five years? Have you been keeping customers? How's that going? So those are the two, uh, and, and, and one more that I, I don't want to ask too many, but I have one more, which is um, so you have a high dependence on on the uh, um, the telephone operator. So, in the case where you have different operators, do you need to have agreement with all of them, or in the case of, of Kenya, you know, Safaricom is the dominant operator, but in other countries, for example, such as um, Uganda, would you have an agreement with MTN, or, or how would that work? for you to be able to reach your target? Beautiful, beautiful questions, uh, uh, Lawrence. Uh, sorry, Raj, you, you, you want to ask one more question? Yeah, so I think there's something that Vishal put in the chat room, um, which feeds into what Lawrence was saying, which is that what happens if Safaricom says, well, you know, I've had enough of this, or sell me your business for three million or whatever it is. You know, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you sort of, how reliant are you on Safaricom and what, what protection do you have on that? Beautiful questions, gentlemen. So uh, let, let me start with the last one from Raj going just right up. So and basically tying the fourth and the third question together. Uh, so how much reliance are we on what you call MNOs, mobile network operators? 
Uh, from where we're seated, it's essentially an aspect of basically, you know, strategic advantages and strategic value additions for both, uh, for both aspects. Um, right now, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the market value of, uh, of mobile operators, they're actually trying to add value, you know, to, 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 to their basic business. So they moved from a mobile telephony, basically for calling purposes, uh, you know, they, they went to, uh, so, uh, you know, a FinTech in terms of MPES and the rest, and then they basically moved to, you know, what I call, you know, social media platforms in terms of WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera. Now, essentially, uh, especially uh, in countries like Kenya, right now the MNO is actually adapting to aspects of partnership. What you basically need to do is show them the value. And uh, what we are basically giving Safaricom is showing them that we're giving them value in terms of business because we are an OTT company over the top, so we basically pay for their uh, SMSs and other services, so essentially giving them the much needed money. But most importantly, we're actually making their uh, you know, um, infrastructure more reliable on people because right now, as he realizes that his phone is not only for calling and sending him Pesa, but it's also for him ordering his favorite pair of sneakers from Alibaba, you know, basically giving them, uh, uh, you know, the addresses. But how we basically tied also this up is the mere fact that we basically have the operating license, for lack of a better word. Uh, from government to actually offer addresses and Safaricom cannot get into that space because we already have the exclusive agreements. So that basically answers for question one for question three. So in terms of the churn rate, we basically have around 25% uh, because uh, we are around at 75% of the clients that we're basically picking and that is increasing. Uh, of course, the major reason we had such a huge churn rate of around 25% is because we were a startup, we never had money for customer care and all these things that is being addressed. Uh, to the first question in terms of the 1.8 million customers, are we going to get that all from Kenya or are we going to get that in terms of consolidating several other countries? The answer is simple. We are looking at basically, uh, uh, you know, having at least uh, 15 million uh, uh, customers or 20 million they have customers in Kenya alone coming on board uh, uh, MPOST. Uh, if you look at the uh, Kenyan uh, mobile space, we have around 47 million people in Kenya, but over 52 million mobile phone users. Okay. Some of them, of course, are repeat users. So essentially, we are looking at, uh, you know, at 15 million of, of those basically coming on board. And of course, that 1.8 million will be realized only in Kenya. Uh, within East Africa, Loro, we are looking at a, a population market of just around 200, uh, 200 million uh, uh, people and basically looking at around at least 120 million of those coming on, on, on board. <clears throat> So uh, it seems that uh, there's quite a few questions, even from the audience, about valuation. And some of that valuation seems to be tied to the deal with Safaricom, uh, as well as the agreement with the government. Um, and uh, Zachariah George has pointed out that, uh, um, that you have a global patent with the, universe, the uh, UPU, the Universal Postal Union. And you really spent the last six months focusing on the partnerships with MPS and Safaricom. Uh, and that the government, um, the agreement with the government is valid uh, indefinitely. Can you validate that? Yes, uh, uh, Jim, I can surely validate that. The only correction I'll make is we have a global patent with, of course, WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, through the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization. Of course, uh, we have the recognition from the Universal Postal Union to roll out in 190 UPU member countries. Right. And I suppose also related to the partnership and acquisition, a question from Udai, uh, what's your long-term strategy? Is this an acquisition play? Uh, Jim, to, to be very sincere, uh, a part of me was saying an acquisition play, but I think my team and I, when we basically critically looked at this, uh, we said an acquisition would be great, but I think we'll go the IPO route for, for, for two simple reasons. The first reason, of course, is we want to create wealth, not only for ourselves, but the large larger African society or the larger African uh, or rather the larger markets that will be, you know, having our business in. And, and of course, uh, history has shown that, you know, the best way to create wealth is to basically involve everybody into the dining table. So we're looking at the IPO in that aspect. But then secondly, if we go the IPO way, it means uh, that it's actually a people's business and a lot of people get to basically own it, then it means it's extremely sustainable. Would you IPO in Kenya? Definitely, Raj. Okay. Interesting. Um, if I could just add something quick, sorry, uh, more of a statement than a question here. I think um, an important part of the business that needs to be understood is the fact that in, in Kenya, like a lot of other African countries, uh, from a KYC perspective, having a legally recognizable postal address is a must. 
So if you look at the large banks, the insurance companies, and the retailers, to be able to properly KYC their clients, you need to have a legal postal address. Right now, 39 million Kenyans use fake postal addresses uh, in order to complete the KYC. So this is a B2B2C solution as well, where large banks and insurers are using MPOST addresses on behalf of their clients to validate KYC. And that's a strategy that the company is, 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 is very much focused on. So it's as much a solution for large corporate, uh, corporates because of fraudulent uh, addresses as it is for the end consumer. And I think that's something that Aziz, you should really focus on. Thank you. Uh, can, can, I, can, can I just ask you another question? Please, as many as you need. Yeah, so my question is this. So, so the, um, the, the, the value here, that would justify the valuation is the license with um, the post office in Kenya and the agreement with Safaricom, right? So in this case, in the expansion that you're planning on having, do you already have the same indefinite and strong license in Uganda, for example? Um, that's, that's one question, but I, I don't think I got the, the answer on the other question on the churn rate. And, uh, and how are you keeping customers? I, I, I don't know if you missed that one, but that's, that's one. And I'd like, to, I'd like to understand also from your perspective, why, what's so unique about the, the solution that you have? What's so innovative about it? And just to add to that, there are some questions from the audience about competition. You know, why can't uh, companies like uh, What Three Words disrupt this? Um, um, you know, KYC going the digital way, uh, best in classes, smile ID. Uh, to Laurent's question, you know, how do you differentiate yourself from those competition competitors? Beautiful questions, gentlemen. So let me start from the last one. So um, the major differentiator, as I said, of course, companies like WeWork and the rest are extremely great companies. Uh, but the differentiation strategy is um, our digital uh, address is not only for private purposes, but also for legal purposes. So it's a globally recognized, you know, digital address. Um, Unfortunately, if you, if you walk into a Kenyan bank with your WeWork address, it, it will not be recognized, uh, but an impulse address will be recognized. So, 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 so that's a, a critical advantage. Uh, on the aspect of our, our churn rate, I did say that we, uh, our churn rate is just around 25%, Laura. Uh, of course, it's a bit high uh, because as a startup, we never even had money to basically had customer care and all these things. Uh, that is being addressed internally and that should continue basically going down. Um, on the aspect of, uh, you know, um, the aspect of our relation, uh, as I said, it's not only based on the fact that we have uh, the contract with the Kenyan government, but then the fact that it is a novel idea that is protected under patent globally. So it basically gives us, uh, you know, some fast move advantage aspects. But then secondly, because of, uh, um, you know, the recognition we have with the Universal Postal Union, uh, I believe Githa having worked uh, with you and understands how the UP works and how, you know, the whole aspect of bureaucracy works. Uh, so it basically, you know, gives us, uh, for lack of a better word, an, ad an advantage and added competition to actually move out into the 190 uh, UPU member countries. Uh, as I said before, uh, Lorraine, we actually, countries are actually inviting us, you know, to, to, to do this and we just have to, you know, kind of keep them on the waiting list. So on the, on the churn rate, so what happened to the people who left? Because one of the things I thought that this was such a sticky product that um, that once you got it, you would not leave. What's the alternatives if you left? Right. That's a very good question, Raj. Um, so essentially, people left for 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 some some asp some reasons, and majorly, uh, especially in the Kenyan market, some of them thought we actually are a lending company, which we are not. So we have a lot of uh, customer or you know uh, citizen uh, education awareness to do. Uh, of course, uh, we now have some two, three customer care people that we brought on board. They're doing exactly that, and we're actually seeing that situation you know, improving. Uh, the other aspect that we basically uh, want to use in terms of strategy, of course, uh, is to basically you know, now improve uh, you know, on other products within our platform, you know, like the door-to-door uh, -door delivery. So, so on that uh, note, uh, we have a question from uh, Anstella Mundi. What percentage or number of the donor care active users talking about stickiness? Sorry, Jim, I, I, didn't, I didn't get that. You want to come yeah. back again? What percentage or number of the 200K are active users? Uh, so uh, by active, we basically refer to the, to the users that have actually paid. And uh, we just have around uh, 40,000 plus who've actually paid 
of the 200,000 users. So, so just, just on, on that one, so I mean, so I was actually looking at what's the definition of an active user in, in a digital bank recently. And there it says that he's made, or he or she has made one transaction in the last month, right? So mm -hmm. what's your metrics for, for, for that? I mean, you know, I could have done one transaction a year ago. Good question, Raj. Um, and, and I think we, that's, that's a question that we asked ourselves internally, even when we started the product, uh, you know, at the business. Uh, and, and for us, the first pain point, uh, probably if I'll have some time, I'll explain how this whole idea came about. The first pain point was actually even the aspect of accessibility uh, that I actually am able to access and address. Uh, and majority of our users, uh, you know, will basically have an address and essentially go to the bank and give that as a usage. But then there's those other users who basically get this address for purposes of, you know, buying stuff from Alibaba, uh, for, for example. Okay. So uh, in that regard, I can just tell you that of the 40,000 users that we have, they have moved over 200,000 plus mails and parcels. Okay. But then there are other aspects of our users who basically, you know, do not have not mailed anything, but have basically been using that address, you know, whenever they asked for it. And essentially, from a frequency perspective, we see at least, you know, uh, each user will probably get around at least uh, two mails, you know, uh, probably per quarter or something. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I think uh, time to have some discussion about uh, whether the angels are interested in this deal. Thoughts? Dita, Laurent, Raj? So this, this is, is the third time coming to you, Raj, right? This is the third time. Would you like to start off, Raj? Uh, yeah, okay. Since, since, uh, since you put me on the spot there, Jim, I'll, I'll start off. So first of all, Abdul Aziz, you know, I think what you've actually got is an incredible product, right? So, um, you know, it's actually serving a huge need, and I, and I, I get it. Um, I think when, when you and I first met in Nairobi last year with Vishal, I think it was Vishal who said, and I think I know Vishal's on, on the call today, um, you know, if you get, you need someone like Safaricom, right? If you get someone like Safaricom, it'll make a big change in business. And all credit to you, you got Safaricom. The thing that worries me and, and sort of doesn't, you know, sort of makes me cautious about the business, forget about the idea, because ideas, everyone has ideas. It's all about execution, is why your revenue hasn't increased at a, better pace having said that you've got Safaricom. So that for me is kind of a, a big stumbling block, right? So that together with the valuation is a big stumbling block for me. Um, I think, you know, if you'd come to me, if, if, if in February we'd had the discussion, you said, I've got Safaricom, I've had 40,000, um, 35,000, 40,000 revenue, but if Safaricom is going to accelerate my revenue to 100,000 in the next 12 months, then I think I would have definitely given you cash. Um, I think the fact that you've got Safaricom and haven't been able to increase the trajectory of your offer, but your valuation has gone up by four times, kind of makes me pause, shall we say. Okay, thank you. So I take it you're out, Raj. I'm out. Okay. Gita, thoughts? So this is a business I've been watching for at least a year. And the piece that I find most interesting is the systematic way in which you've gone about to get uh, the agreement to operate, both from government as well as within the logistics chain. Where I feel this can get very interesting is in terms of big data. When I think about what, how this, was, this sort of approach was used in India with the India stack um, and in terms of really rapidly scaling access to information in terms of identity of people. And so I'd love to understand a little bit more as to what your plans are on the big data side of things. I'd also like to understand, you know, with the, with the effects of, of COVID-19 hitting, how is this going to likely affect this business going forward? So this is one I really want to watch a little bit more closely and I'd like to follow up 
after this uh, this conversation to to do a bit more due diligence but i find this actually quite quite compelling though i also do concur i find the valuation um quite pricey based on the discussions we've had and uh, the limited engagement we've had so far great thank you Gita. laurent thoughts so um I think it's, like I said at the beginning, I think he has a, a very good business model and he's in, certainly in a space where the service is needed. Um, I'm a little bit thrown off by you know, the valuation and by the slow growth rate. I think there, there is some synergies um, that I think you know, I'd like to, to carry on in offline discussions. But for the reason of the valuation and the slow growth rate, I'm out. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, just to show the polls here, show the results, uh, we had uh, quite a few people voting um, and um, uh, quite a few on the bottom end, but also a few on the top end as well. So um, thank you very much, uh, Abdul Aziz, for presenting today. And it sounds like there's some interesting conversations to be had with Laurent as well as with Gita, and maybe you can present a fourth time to Raj as well. Thank you, thank you, Julie. thank you, Angels. Sorry, my, my internet had just uh, frozen there. Uh, but, but, but very, very interesting, and I'll, 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 if it's not, if not acting too much, I'll probably, you know, um, pick up with, uh, with you guys offline. Uh, Gita, uh, Lore, Raj, see how we can basically get some other aspects of synergies. Absolutely. Sure. That'd be great. Great. Right. Thank you again. All right, on to the uh, next presenter then, uh, Matthias from Julia. Are you ready? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, uh, sorry. Hello, Jim. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? We can yeah. hear you well, yes. Okay, so. Share your screen and get started whenever you like. And just as a caveat, you have five minutes. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. And we hear you loud and clear. Okay, so um, hi everyone again. I'm Matthias Leopoldi, co-founder of Julia, and I'm really excited to pitch uh, this startup tonight at The Nest. So just to start, uh, sorry. Okay, just to start, I'm gonna zoom in on a specific market that you may have heard of, which is the mobile money market. And the mobile money market, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, is really taking a, a huge trend. So um, just to give some example, but if you look at West Africa, which is the region where we operate, uh, this is a market which is growing 29% annually. So uh, if you take a country like Ivory Coast, you have now 50% uh, of the GDP, roughly, that goes onto mobile money transactions. Okay, just, to, just a bit of a reminder of uh, what kind of market we're talking about. Uh, knowing this, uh, I'm showing you just like Linspar, uh, you have to, to know and you must probably know that Americans and SMEs uh, in those markets, they represent 80% of the businesses. And yet, they process, let's say, roughly 10% of digital transactions. So there is a big discrepancy between mobile money usage between B2B and B2C usage. So it's, more, it's, a, it's a really B2C product and not a B2B product right now, uh, especially in this region. And uh, why is that so? So several reasons, but the main one, the, the main one is uh, regarding the user experience. So you have a poor user experience in those markets because you have first a lack of interoperability between the solutions. So if you look at Ivory Coast, for example, it's really difficult for a market to accept uh, several means of, of, of payments or to send through different mobile monies. Like you have the three MNOs and it's almost impossible to send between all the MNOs. So it has a transactional problem, but it also brings issues in terms of uh, accounting, security, and uh, traceability of the transactions. So you, you will hear the Americans saying, I don't wanna use the B2B solution from Orange or MTN because uh, it's, a, it's a pain for me. So I, I'd rather use like a B2C solution and I'm not interested in your professional, professional solution. So this is the problem you get. Uh, yet the market is opening uh, due to two reasons. First. Uh, there is an increasing penetration of smartphone, uh, especially uh, among Americans. And also you have companies, uh, fintech companies that aggregate financial services and provide APIs to actually uh, give them new services and make new services to those people. This is why, uh, thanks to this market opportunity, we decided to uh, launch Julia and to redefine the digital financial services uh, for SMEs. Uh, what, we do with, what we do is we provide them with a 
wallets, digital wallet that they can use to make all their transactions. Wire transfer, so mobile banking, mobile money, you can see the full transaction history. They can access it through a desktop and a mobile app and have the best, uh, like uh, one of the best customer experience they can get in terms of financial transactions. So how do we work? We have a two, well, a two-fold business model. We have a SaaS subscription, so they pay a monthly fee to access the platform. And we have a transactional part, so to every service we give, we get uh, a fees or uh, we charge the customer, depending on the service, so for mobile money or for uh, wire transfer, for example. In terms of targets, so as I was talking, we have two segment, two target segments. We have the SMEs on one part that want to do disposals, so to pay, for example, their salaries or to pay uh, 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 clients, and also they want to acquire payments, so they want to acquire payments for mobile money, Visa, Mastercard. And we also target the merchants uh, that do the kind of opposite transactions, so they pay the suppliers, but they also do payment acquisition. In terms of traction, since May 2019, uh, we've seen a great uptake. So um, we've got some new SMEs uh, in February, March, and we've seen like a three times increase in our transaction volumes. Uh, just to tell you like the new customers we got, and it's more like the upper end of the SMEs, but we've got logistics platform, we've got e-commerce platform like Jumia, and uh, we've got like mining operations. So we, we can even go higher than the SMEs market uh, in terms of uh, target segment. Um, just to talk so now about this round, so uh, we already uh, opened a safe uh, round of uh, investments in uh, uh, 20, uh, late 2019, and uh, we already have 350K subscribed uh, out of the 500K euros we wanted to get. Uh, and to give you some like uh, 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 info on the remaining uh, uh, investments we have, so it's 100K, uh, and we have, uh, we try to get some investors in the uh, knowledge of uh, fintech uh, space in Africa. So we have uh, investors uh, from uh, Nigerian fintech, like Deadcrest Capital or uh, Shinu Capital is also interested. Uh, but we also have uh, core banking integrators like CBI. I don't know if you know them, but they are operating in Morocco and they integrate uh, core banking applications for uh, large banks like Bank of Africa. Uh, and our mission in, uh, in uh, five years is, so Julia becomes a verb uh, which means paying, uh, doing all your accounting and uh, doing your business. It actually means trade in the Bambara language. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great presentation and great timing. Over to the angels. Um, the question, first of all, um, I think it's, it's a, you know, you're in the right space. You know, I think all money is going to go digital, you know, very soon. And, um, and we've seen the progress that mobile money has done in Africa. And being in that space is definitely the right, you, you know, in the, you're in the right sector. Um, the question that I have is what is um, your growth strategy? Um, you're currently in Ivory Coast. Uh, what is the, the, the growth strategy for the region? Um, that's the first question. And then the second question is uh, what is your background? Okay. Uh, thank you, Laurent. So in terms of growth strategy, um, I would say, and this is especially uh, regarding the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis that we a bit shifted in terms of growth strategy, because we saw that the most profitable customers were the uh, SMEs part before the American part. So we know that the market will have like a, a entail where the Americans make the most of transactions, and this is the customers we want to address. But in terms of strategy, we find more profitability in the large SMEs or SME segments. So uh, today we focus on those types of clients because we have a sales team uh, that's uh, put in place and we know exactly how to uh, uh, conquer them. And we see, uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, we can uh, reach profitability quite soon in this segment market and then see if we want to raise capital to uh, 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 go down on the market of the Americans, or if we just uh, uh, want to use our proceedings from the profitability uh, not to dilute ourselves too much. Uh, and in terms of market opening, uh, so Ivory Coast is already a big market in the, in the region. It's uh, for the uh, YMU, so eight uh, Francophone Africa, Senegal, Goa, uh, Mali, Burkina, etc. It represents 40% of the transaction volumes. Um, so it's already a, kind of a big market, but uh, in terms of expansion, uh, we already have uh, 
agreements with uh, fintech companies in uh, in Ghana, for example. So we we know the pricing from Flutterwave, for example. Uh, the the market is quite similar uh, in terms of uh, um, size and in terms of uh, how business works there, because it's a uh, you know like Cocoa Export kind of uh, 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 positive balance trade co country. So uh, you have a lot of similar companies uh, uh, that you can uh, reach in this market. Uh, but also, uh, Zquest Capital wants us to go to Nigeria, but we say Nigeria is a bit of a specific market for now uh, and a bit different uh, with uh, mobile money transactions. And the uh, second, second question uh, regarding our background. So uh, uh, maybe, uh, am I still sh sharing my screen? Oh, no, okay. Yeah. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yeah, no, yeah go ahead and share your screen. Go ahead if you want to share. Um... Okay, so uh, maybe I'll just share it just to show you the team because uh, in five minutes it was a bit difficult. Uh, While you're doing that, there was also a question from the audience that I think was very relevant to what you're, uh, what Roland just asked you. Okay, uh, it was really so, about, um, and this is a rather pr crowded space already. Yes. Um, and, um, and a lot of the solutions are sub regional, uh, yes. very localized. So what differentiates um, Julia, and I guess, you know, uh, I would add to that question is what differentiates it in allowing it to go regional? Okay, so um, in terms of, of uh, so in terms, just in terms of background, we've, we've worked at a uh, uh, French fintech company before, which is the number one French fintech in France called Lemonway, and they had operations in Mali and Burkina Faso. So we were working uh, for this company for uh, several years between 2015 and 2017. Uh, and in terms of strategy, what we see is that it's impossible to cover all the market segments with uh, one fintech strategy. So if you look at the, at the strategy that those companies have, uh, and what we see from dev developed markets is that when you're providing API solution, it's really difficult to target a market segment that don't need APIs. And what we see, for example, in our customers, they don't want to do API integration in, some, in their platform. They don't have the technical resource and they don't have the use because their transaction volume is quite low in terms of uh, uh, how much uh, transactions they make. So a typical customer for us and SME, they would make uh, no more than $50,000 transaction a month. So it's not high enough to integrate an API uh, or, or bear the costs of the API. So what, what we do is we partner, maybe I can show you, all, I must have this slide with our partners. Yes, we partners with all the other FinTechs that have the APIs. And what we do, uh, not to be dependent on them, is we balance the transactions between, we balance the transactions, so there is no bargaining power from them. So uh, the, what we think the value is created is when you have the end customer. Uh, uh, in front of you. And so just to give you an example, but for Jumia, uh, this supplier is called Intouch, which has raised much more money than us. It is already in eight countries. It's one of our suppliers in terms of APIs. They wanted to get Jumia in Ivory Coast, but they didn't get Jumia because they were not able to give Jumia as high quality of transaction than us because we could balance between all the providers uh, for the quality of transactions. Um, this way we can invest all our uh, strategy in the, just the user experience. So for example, if you go with us, you will have uh, different sub accounts. So you can give an account to your HR director or to your finance director. And also you can have a uh, two way validation like what we call strong authentication. So you will, you will uh, have like Google Authenticator and have a double validation of the transactions, which is something that none of our suppliers provide the clients with. So it's more like a user experience thing and they, they didn't go into this specific segment because it's not something their clients ask. Uh, and maybe just uh, lastly to say, uh, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, uh, user experience, so uh, we provide them with a solution that's also accessible on mobile and on desktop, which is something uh, we put a lot of uh, attention to. So we have AWS in terms of uh, in terms of uh, technical setting, uh, and uh, we provide like uh, IT support through, uh, you know, a system of ticketing. So we really invest in customer experience. So they, they get an answer. If you want, you can go on the website and ask the customer support to get an answer within five minutes. Matthias, um, uh, first of all, good to meet you, and you know, well done for getting so far. I, I had a number of questions, and and they all kind of relate in a sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to pick up, pick up 
first of all, the, the sort of fact that there's a crowded space, but we'll come back to that in a minute. I think we all understand the crowded space and I want to understand a little bit more about USP. And you talked about that, but I didn't really understand it. But the thing that I wanted to really understand is what, the, what your growth strategy is. Because it seems to me that your the strategy of going for SME is a good one. And actually, I looked at a company that was doing loans to SMEs in India. Mm-hmm. And what they did was they went to the largest SME organization and they did a partnership with them. So mm-hmm. immediately, they got access to 10,000 SMEs in India. So it made that customer acquisition much quicker. Um, mm-hmm. I, I won't go into the details of that, but I wanted to ask you, you know, what is your customer acquisition strategy? Um, yes. And, you know, what's your cost of acquisition and how do you make it back? You're doing it in the local language, which I think is um, is a good thing. And that will, will make it actually more difficult for us to do. But again, I, my, my, my sense is that, you know, where you are is, is, you know, I think what you need, what you need, I feel, and I'm not sure I've got, got it yet, is a better stranglehold on that customer acquisition strategy mm-hmm. um, and, and a better moat, you know, for want of a better word, to stop, you know, the big players just coming and wiping you out. Mm-hmm. And I wondered whether you had some ideas around that and what your reaction is to that. Mm-hmm. Um. So, so for us, um, um, just like you said, in terms of uh, acquisition strategy, so we have this kind of partnership. So I'm just showing you, well, it's in French, sorry, but uh, it's the, uh, we have a partnership with what we call the Conseil Fédéral des Commerçants de Côte d'Ivoire, which is the, the you know, uh, Americans and SME uh, uh, Union. Uh, so we have a partnership with them to get access to their uh, markets. And uh, it's also something that provides us uh, um, a shortcut in terms of regulation, because with them, even if, uh, if it's an informal market, we can finance uh, you, the, the, the formalization of this SME or this market thanks to this partnership, which is a shortcut for the regulation, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to process transactions for them. So it's a, a small uh, also acquisition uh, you know, uh, uh, shortcut. And, uh, um, the, the, the other thing we've just put in place is we have, we're starting to sign partnership with banks and with a, um, a transaction response, uh, transaction, well, we call that responsible, uh, 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 people that uh, hold the transaction in the banks uh, because they have the, 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 their clients asking for them to do these kind of transactions and they don't have the platform to do them. So we, we, we bought them a special contract. Uh, we, signed, we signed one with a Moroccan bank in uh, Ivory Coast so that they can onboard their clients on our platform and then they get a revenue cut. They get 20% revenue cut of the, of the transactions we see made. And uh, it's something yeah. that we're really looking at. Yeah, so I think just to address the question, I think customer acquisition costs 105 euros. Yes, for right? an SME, yes. Yeah, and it takes you about five months to recover that from a customer. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. And lifetime value? If we no. take, um, like today, out of the 15 SMEs that are alive since, uh, so the first one is in October 2019, but we have zero churn on the, on the SMEs. So uh, it's at okay. least uh, six months lifetime, but uh, <laughs> well, we hope it can be two, three years lifetime. Okay. Uh, Matthias, nice to meet you. Um, where are you right now? Well, are you based? Yeah, what you can see behind me is our Abidjan office, but it's actually closed now. So I put it, um, but it, we are all on remote uh, working. So uh, the IT team is in Paris and the, all the um, um, operational team, finance, customer support, uh, uh, sales team and uh, sales team. They're all in Abidjan. We are all in Abidjan. So okay. I'm the one based in Abidjan, and the IT team with my co-founder is based in Paris. But the okay. thing is, the we say it's based in Paris, but actually it's a international team because we have developers in Tunisia. In um, we have one uh, backend developer also in Ivory Coast, so it's more international. Okay, and. Uh... Do you feel that uh, you're quite comfortable at the position you've gotten to in terms of developing the, um, in terms of developing the product, or is there going to be a need for any 
significant amounts of investment to come in in the course of the next 12 to 18 months to upgrade the, the product? Um, no, in terms of IT, um, so, so our take is to say um, where we invest uh, all the research and development and we're just getting a new loan for research and development is in the uh, features uh, in terms of user experience. So it's, it, we are not going to go into the territory of, you know, uh, building APIs because our partner can do it pretty well. But where we're going to go uh, is uh, how can we acquire the, more, uh, the most SMEs at first and the most, the, like the fastest uh, for our competitors because our, our providers, our fintech partners, they are also our competitors uh, in the market. Uh, but today we can, we have a stronger brand recognition from our customers than them. Uh, so, and since we can balance transaction flows between each other, uh, we can get the customers faster. Okay. And in terms of competition, just to go back to that for yes. a minute, um, where is it that you expect potential competitors to come through? Is it existing um, regional players who are looking to expand into the markets that you are, you are looking at? Is there potential uh, additional competition coming through the moment a, a telco decides to look at this space more seriously? And how would you actually try to address those potential challenges? Yes, so um, it's, a, it's the heart of the question you're asking because the, what we see is the, today the competition comes from uh, all those three actors. So we see, for example, Flutterwave is opening the uh, Ivory Coast market, right? But actually Flutterwave uh, uh, sees that the market is not as ripe as they would like it to be uh, compared to where, where they operated before in terms of the technology. So they see they don't they see the investment cost is really high and they don't see if it's going to be profitable etc. So it's there it's still really early for them. So Flutterwave actually asked us to grow our APIs and we said, we, we cannot give you the APIs because we we already partner with some fintech so we can go to one of our providers. Um, uh, I would say in terms of uh, it's going to be a, a a race, but I come from the fintech industry and I um in France and you see you always think there is a winner tech or in fintech, but this is not true. There, there is a, a niche market for every type of fintech. So you cannot do everything uh, like 100% of the market. And if you take, for example, Stripe, you know, Stripe, they said, okay, we're gonna go to the SME market. But what people didn't know is that they didn't have the technology for processing payments. They were going through payment partners. And it's, a, it's, a, it's something you see if you look at the European market, for example, there is a fintech with a market niche that they address. So, for example, uh, we believe in those markets, you can be profitable and you can find very high profitability with this niche segment because uh, your product is going to be really fit to this customer. And when we look at some, uh, you know, some user experience in, uh, uh, if you look at the experience of one of our uh, suppliers, for example, it's so complicated that an SME will never use it. They don't understand, so they say it's too complicated for me. They want something simple. They want something, you know, when they like just log in, they push the button, they want to open the account pretty fast and this kind of stuff. Uh, and from the telcos, uh, lastly, um, what you can see is the today they are considering should they open their APIs to banks or not? Uh, what is it going to do? Um, so because they saw in the Kenyan market, for example, uh, the banks are really uh, getting stronger in terms of uh, transaction volumes and it's a bit of eviction effect from the mobile money to the to the bank so they're they are still wondering okay how is it gonna play is it gonna a profit benefit the banks more than the telcos um, so we see that they have their own offers but it doesn't take off because the as I was saying in my introduction the companies they don't just want they just don't want one solution so you have orange saying take my platform uh, you can send money but then the people say okay Okay, but if they don't have orange money and then orange money has no other partnerships because they want to have the you know uh, only uh, uh, only send to orange money and they say don't worry i'll provide you with sim cards for your customers etc but they say it's taking too long i just want to send money to all the networks so what we're trying to do is um uh, thanks to all these uh, partner we get all the services in one place so um 
the user experience it's a global approach so you have to have the more services on your platform to get the user experience so is the niche that you want to to occupy one where you're an aggregator of services across multiple partners and that works as long as that balance is held as long as you don't have somebody you know regulation changing as we've seen in nigeria yes. whereby banks have been told you need to actually be working with a larger group of SMEs than you currently are right now and you have a timeline by which you need to get 20, 20 million new I have is um, we know this space is quite crowded I'm still struggling to understand what that niche proposition yes. is and in terms of customer acquisition um, the challenge that I'm also seeing is uh, how are you differentiating yourself and how are you able to segment customers to such an extent where it's not a case of looking at all SMEs, but perhaps starting to look at it by, by sector, yes. by, by seeing where the most productive uh, yes. customers are going to come from, knowing that you're not going to be going head to head with banks who may be going after those same group of customers as well. Yes, exactly. And I think, sorry, just, just, just to add on to that, I think the other thing is that, you know, so, so this business I'm looking at in India may be quite relevant for you because the problem that the banks have is that they don't understand how SMEs work. They don't really have, they're not set up to deal with SMEs. So if you can be the intermediary between the bank and the SME, then I think that could actually be something quite good for you. So there was a comment from Raul and Antoine, quite a common question. Banks are making a lot of money on SMEs back in the Ivory Coast. Aren't you threatening their income? Will they come after you? Will they let you work? Yeah, so I wouldn't say we're threatening their income because we are just um, providing them with a, an extent in terms of transactions they make. Because what we see today is what they do is they already make mobile money transactions, but they will go to their mobile uh, you know, uh, agent outlet and they will go with cash and say, send this to this, to this, to this, to this. To this. And it's really painful, really unreliable and... Most of the time, they, they realize they lose a lot of money, a lot of traceability. So while we say if, we, if, we, if the banks ask for a partnership, like the, it's called the SIPs or Achijai Wafa in Ivory Coast, for example, we, we say there is no problem for us because the, we are not giving loans. We are not, and we are putting all the money from our customers in banks. So they still get the money inside. So for their ratios and uh, it's, it's increasing their, you know, uh, um, what they call the, covering ratios for for you know their deposits etc etc so they we've we've never or they don't say say to us that they see us as a threat so well thank you very much um well over to the angels now what uh, what do you all think um listen i i i think this is a super difficult space right um and i think it's one of the audience commented that you know, with, with, with this sort of space, unless you've got a USP, it becomes a race to the bottom. Um, and it looks like, you know, your customer acquisition is actually quite slow and expensive. Um, I, I, I find it difficult to see how you're going to grow at a rate that you need to grow to become big enough to ward off the various um, other predators in the market. So, I mean, that's my initial analysis. I'd be delighted to hear other people's opinions on it. May, may I just had, I, I just wanted to know the 50K that's the ask is, um, I'm not clear on the, on the, the equity that's being, you know, given for the, or, or the, you know, I mean, what's the ask 50K, but for what equity? Should I reply? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, it's a safe investment. So the con condition, I think uh, they are, we are put here. So it's the, so it's translated in dollars, but it's uh, there is a gap at four point uh, uh, four million three hundred twenty uh, hundred thousand dollars with a twenty five percent discount. So uh, if you ask, is fifty k because that's that's the only thing that's uh, kind of left out of the round okay. ask for more than, than this, except if one of the uh, investors uh, withdraws. But uh, so it will give you, uh, we can send you the, the um, Excel simulation where you can see uh, in the most favorable or least favorable condition of the exercise of the safe, how much you would get. 
but with this valuation and this discount, uh, I think it will be around 3%, something like this. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts? So, no. um, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Always ladies first. So, a number of the, uh, the parties that you mentioned are actually already in my portfolio. So, it's, it's always interesting to hear a different perspective as well. Um, my concern is, is this is genuinely quite a crowded space and, and I worry for the ability to hold your position and grow your, your customer base quickly um, to, to make that be a, a strong part of the, the value that you're bringing here, either to a potential acquirer or, or to other partners. Um, it, may, it feels a little bit uh, early for, for what I'm looking for. Um, and the, the piece that I'm sort of still struggling to, to get my head around is the customer acquisition and what a more rapid path to customer acquisition can be absent of having that customer acquisition funded through investor capital. So do you, I don't think I, I saw that, but do you have an estimate as to when you think you're going to break even? Yes. So what we put on the, on the actual uh, uh, burn of uh, around 40K, sorry, uh, around 30K, sorry, 28K dollars, uh, we would be breaking even uh, around Q2, uh, second quarter of 2021. Uh, but our goal is to make it even faster because what we see today is we can charge higher to our customers. So we just signed, for example, Opera News. And Opera News, it's like, a, it's a, uh, they're bringing in 1.3K monthly revenue in addition. So we say, if we can just get like 20 customers like Opera News, then uh, we, we will be breaking even, even faster. And uh, we've seen in the top 500 companies in, in Ivory Coast, this is uh, something actually will be before the end of the year. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, Gita. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, Raj. And thank you, uh, Matthias. Thanks. Uh, I'm not an angel, but uh, I would like to speak with you, with you afterwards. There might be some opportunities uh, in terms of partnership with untapped and what we're trying to do in West Africa, mobile payments, and especially in dealing with SMEs. So okay. uh, let's stay in touch and uh, never know. We can dig down a little bit deeper and uh, um, you know, like participate in, in that last bit of your round. Thank uh, you again. Some, nope. Sorry, Jim. I think there were some good ideas in the, in the chat about payments and all the rest of it. So I'm sure you could share that with them. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and just to let you know, the, the chat box is shared shared with everyone uh, publicly uh, at the end of uh, each session. So okay, thank you. Absolutely, we'll connect you with some of the folks that uh, have, have mentioned. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you again. We have launched a poll. Um, if you have not already voted, uh, please please do vote. Um, as you'll see, uh, we had over 50% with a zero, but uh, some uh, in the smaller range uh, coming in as well. Uh, thanks again uh, to us for the presentation. And now we're off Thank to you. the next presentation. Um, hold on right here. Oh, I've lost the screen. All right, Mohammed, are you online and are you ready to present? Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Very good. Very well. Very good. Alhamdulillah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I'd like just to thank uh, Jim for this opportunity, and I hope uh, you are all uh, safe and healthy during this uh, time and even after, ever after. So uh, I just can start now by sharing my presentation. Yes, please. Go ahead and start, and you have five minutes. Okay.
So is it clear now? Yes, it is. Great. So most of our classes and meetings are based on lecture method. You may feel bored, disconnected, and disengaged. It's no surprise. By using lecture method, studies have shown that we can only retain 5% of the information delivered, which hinders collaboration and engagement. While when people collaborate, even with the simplest tools, magic happens. That's why I'd like to introduce to you our product, a device that transforms any huge monitor into fast and accurate interactive surface for collaboration, whether it was a TV screen or even a projected wall. Use a black tag detector to your, uh, your computer USB port and point the detector towards a monitor, as I said, such a TV screen or a projected wall. And now the, complete, and the new surface is completely interactive. So you can use visual aids, interactive applications, access internet, record lessons, work in Microsoft programs such as Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and just about any computer application you control with a mouse. So there are different alternatives in the market which deliver similar functionality, including some direct competitors such as GoTouch, uh, UBI, and TouchJet and also indirect competitors such as the interactive whiteboard, which are most known in the educational sector, uh, in addition to touch screens and interactive projectors. While uh, what makes Stack different from all these uh, solutions is first, it's portable and can fit at any space. And also, it's durable. It, it doesn't include electronic boards or electronic uh, surfaces such as electronic boards that can easily damage with wear and tear. It covers huge areas, up to 150 inch screens, which is almost three meters width and two meters height. It's compatible with any type of TV screens, any type of projectors, and any type of software. And last but not least, it's cost effective. It costs less than half the price of an electronic board. So we make money by selling that kit for only $300. The kit includes the detector, two styluses, and one year warranty. We also offer after sales and maintenance services, which adds an average margin of 15%. And also, we offer through our free partnership program some complementary products such as screens, projectors, and BCs. We have served uh, more than 55 B2B customers in uh, more than four uh, countries in the Middle East, in addition to Denmark. Our uh, clients include private and uh, uh, governmental entities from schools, universities, NGOs, and also uh, uh, public sector, which we have sold 407 tickets, generating $150,000 in revenues. And we have 70% multiple repeat customers who, who buy kits year after year to fulfill their capacity not to replace uh, the old units. Uh, and all of that. Uh, while maintaining a 70% gross margin, which can also increase based on economies of scale. With the current, in the current uh, quarter, uh, we are also negotiating with more than 30 potential customers, uh, including uh, the American University in Cairo, but actually I, I, I'm just glad to announce that we have already closed uh, our deal with the American University in Cairo. In addition to negotiating with other entities such as Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and the World Food Program, IT Works, and so on. And through the next two quarters, we are aiming to expand our reach through distribution network and through distributors, uh, uh, especially in Europe and Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. And for the, and then for the first quarter uh, during 2021, we will be launching our next product it's called Pendu. Pendu is an enhanced stylus that enables you to remotely control your screen from a distance without, without having to touch a screen. So Pendu is a, click, is a clicker, air mouse, and gesture controller all in one stylus. Bendu actually can work with TAC to add to attack a greater functionality, but also can work as a standalone device, where we aim to launch it on a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter in the third quarter of the next year, mainly to be able to, uh, uh, to end that year by selling 1,500 TAC kits and 2,500 Bendu devices, generating half million dollars in revenue. 
Our market is huge. Interactive display market is expected to reach $13.8 billion by 2024. Uh, the projection for the VCs and projected sales in KSA only for next year is $885 million. This is the team behind Interact. Uh, together, we have combined experience of over 20 years of technical development, hardware distribution, marketing, and project management. We are seven uh, team, uh, full team uh, members. We are seven uh, uh, full-time team members uh, in addition to free freelancers and partners. And we aim to expand our team while we go forward. We also uh, was awarded different uh, and local and international awards from credited entities such as Intel, which shows how our product is uh, verified and uh, qualified, uh, in addition to other international local awards, as just as I said. So we mainly are raising uh, $400,000, mainly to be spent on research and development, expansion and marketing. Uh, and before I finish, I'm also preparing a live demo for our product. Uh, where you can see uh, 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 here I'm converting a normal TV screen to be interactive. So this is actually so this is actually a normal TV that's it's not uh, a screen. But now, as you can see, I can control anything on this computer. So if I was uh, 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 using it in an educational institute, for example, I can just use it to write anything that I want. I can use visual aids or search, for example, for uh, so this is a type of a virtual experiment that also teachers can use to demonstrate an idea for the students. So instead of just writing an equation on the board and waiting for the students to understand it, they can use a virtual experiment. This is a one uh, for, uh, actually for free on the internet that shows how the liquid speed differs according to the tube diameter. And now students can see how things work and how the speed changes according to this. And also can add fractions and so on. So this is one of uh, millions of simulations for free on the internet that students can use to understand uh, uh, things uh, more clearly. And also, there are also other uh, applications, any application that you control with a mouse so you can access the internet, for example, and search for anything that you want. You can start using uh, the keyboard, for example, to uh, start uh, searching and so on. Perfect. Mohammed, we're starting to run out of time. Thank you very much. That was a very, uh, anything else you want to add before uh, you finish? No, uh, no, I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Great, I'm gonna put up a quick screen as well, just so that others can see. Great, well, over to the angels. So, Mohammed, marhaba. Ahlan, good. marhaba. Good to see you, are you in Cairo? Yep. Um, listen, I, I, I love the idea. Uh, I really like the idea. Um, I have a few questions around um, just the, just what it is. So, so it's, it, in my mind, it seems like a hardware kind of product, right? It's, it's, a, it's a physical product. Yeah. So actually, it's a hardware and software product, yes. Okay. So, it, yeah, but it's a physical product. So, and where is it manufactured? So we manufacture part of it in China and also in Egypt. And we have uh, also uh, uh, the ability to uh, totally produce the product locally in Egypt. And we, had, and we have done uh, samples of it with uh, ministry. Uh, it's called uh, here in Egypt. Uh, and also we can move our production facility from, uh, in other spaces that actually would add uh, greater uh, uh, value for uh, local production in different countries. And, and you've sold 470 units over what period? So we actually started selling from 2016, but we, st we started actually by just uh, some knocking doors uh, uh, activities. Uh, and now we are also selling through distributors and, in, and, and channels that is indirect uh, sales channels. So actually the sales have been uh, exponential somehow. Uh, when you say exponential, what, what is it? It's gone from what to what in what period? 
So actually, uh, I'm not. I don't have uh, uh, a chart here to view, but uh, roughly speaking, like we have been started with selling around 30 kits, uh, the uh, or th from 30 to 50 th kits around when we started in the first year, and then uh, we have sold uh, last year around uh, 200 uh, kits. So uh, this is how things uh, is going. And. And the IP, the intellectual property, you registered a patent or? So um, actually, we don't have, we didn't have the uh, financial capability or the time that we can uh, invest in the IP for the last period. But actually, we are putting some of the current amount of investment uh, to be able to register the IP, an international IP, because the IP here in Egypt all alone will not be enough. Uh, okay. And also, uh, in, a, in another uh, uh, direction, we are also innovating and uh, doing some uh, taking some steps forward in the r d uh, so always we can be uh, a step forward uh, from the competition so for example we are now working on different solutions or it's it's not a different solution it's an enhanced versions of the product that has a greater functionality for the product so for example uh, the device now is a wireless uh, version plug and play without having to install any software and also uh, we have a software uh, subscription model for uh, sharing all the attendees, all, all the lecturer uh, voice and screen recording and handwriting with the attendees' smart devices. So people can attend or lectures wherever they, wherever they are, especially for rural uh, uh, geographical areas who lack a good quality teachers and trainers. They can actually now attend a lecture that is uh, delivered in Harvard or in Cairo University and so on with uh, some protocols, of course, uh, done. So we also have, uh, as I said, in our roadmap, our next product, Pendu, which is a stylus that can enable you to remotely control your screen. Uh, so uh, this is will also an add a, a greater value for the users where they can control their computers while, while having sitting on their chairs and presenting and annotating and so on. So, yeah. And, and can you use it on uh, any any surface, or is it does it have to be a, a screen? Does it have to be a television? Or can you use it on a wall or, or a piece of glass? Or? Exactly, exactly. That's that's the power of tact. Actually, it can converse any surface to be interactive. So, for example, it can be worked now with monitors such as projectors on a wall or a projector on a. Uh, glass or a projector or a whiteboard, a normal whiteboard, but also there's a huge added value and opportunity for TAC to work in home automation without even having a monitor because TAC can convert any wall to be interactive and you can control your IoT devices without having a monitor directly from any space. So actually it can dominate the spaces around us and convert it to a control unit for digital media around us, especially when uh, uh, technology go goes forward and uh, the virtual reality and augmented reality uh, uh, actually take uh, some part of our life. So uh, we actually intend to be the control unit that control all these digital media around us. Shukra. Thank you. Mohammed, this is really exciting. This is really, really exciting. And congratulations on, on the work here. And, and what I find interesting is it feels to me there's the production element of this and there's a lot associated with that. You know, the financing of the production of these items, of the kit, is, has a whole other cost structure to the development of the intellectual property. So the first bit of advice I'd give is get that patented very, very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, I, I know that this point is very valid and actually I'm waiting for uh, the, the current round for investment to take part of this ID. Yeah. Okay. Now, the, the second thing I was going to say is, I, you know, the market, I think, for this is huge. It's absolutely huge. But I'm quite fascinated by the broad geographical reach you're aiming for here between Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, as well as Sub-Saharan Africa, I presume. Could you tell me a little bit more as to why you're going that broad as opposed to focusing in, in one region? You know, I'm seeing you've got 55 customers currently. Um, that they're spread quite across uh, the, the regions that you've, we, we've, we've uh, mentioned before. But I'd like to better understand why it is you're, you're looking to go as broad as you are. 
Okay, thank you for this question. Actually, um, um, uh, just you, you've mentioned two points now: the the, the cost of goods sold for production, uh, and that's that's actually I I just uh, I mentioned that we have thirty percent costs, which is a good percent to start with, and actually it can go lower with economies of scale. That's one. The second part for the uh, distribution or the, the expansion in different geographical areas, as you said, our product actually is not a, an industry uh, segmented product. Or, uh, uh, so actually, we are more activity oriented product than a segment oriented product. Uh, our product can actually work in different categories, uh, whether education, businesses, advertisement, uh, uh, games, and so on. But actually, we are concentrating mainly on the main biggest two markets, with, uh, which is education at the first, and the second for meeting rooms in the businesses. So, or meetings, actually, uh, whatever. So, uh, these are the, the main two segments that we are focusing on. And, and when, just, when we started uh, going to the market, we started with a direct sales strategy where we can help uh, uh, schools and talk with them and sell uh, to them the product and that was essential mainly for the first step of our, our, our journey because we have to learn uh, and uh, listen to our customers feedback and then go back and develop on the, our product but now uh, we have uh, mainly uh, uh, reached uh, a, a version of our product that can easily uh, plug and play product and can spread wildly and that's why we have started our new channel which is indirect sales selling through distributors kind of distributors who sell TV screens, uh, projectors, electronic services, and also who offers IT solutions for these entities. And these kind of distributors, actually, we have met a lot of them in different geographical areas, whether uh, uh, our uh, exhibitions and events in JITEX in Dubai or uh, in e-learning Africa and so on. And we have found a lot of them are interested to deal with our product. So we have worked hard so we can uh, uh, develop our version of uh, tact so it can be easily uh, uh, moved from uh, one, one place to another and can be installed uh, remotely without having our team uh, especially in their back so what we are focusing on now uh, beside Egypt we are focusing on the Saudi Arabia market because it's the second biggest market in the MENA region and Africa uh, but, but also we don't close uh, doors for any distributor who want to deal with the, with us, especially if there is a contract that shows how things will work uh, in, or, in, in, in uh, an aspect of uh, quantities of the product and uh, delivery time and stock and so on. So actually we have a list of potential distributors in, uh, in Europe, in Africa. So we are just negotiating with them and see how things will work. Okay, one, one very quick last question here. Um, so what I saw is that 70% of your customers are repeat customers. Do these tend to be in the education space, just trying one, one unit out, it works well, and, and what's the, the kind of uptick that you're seeing when they do come back? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. As actually, uh, the, the multi repeat customer, as I said, they, uh, those who upsell to fulfill their capacity. So for example, they, are in, they include schools, uh, corporates and NGOs. So these are the, th the three segments that we have been focusing on and actually each one of them have a huge capacity. Uh, the lowest capacity of them is the corporates where uh, it may uh, don't have a lot of meeting rooms or uh, don't have a lot of training facilities. But for the schools and NGOs, NGOs, I'm talking about uh, NGOs who are working on developing education in community schools. And we all actually have worked with Masr al Khair, it's one of the biggest NGOs here in Egypt, working with uh, around uh, um, uh, eight governorates here in Egypt in community school, in 25 community schools. So uh, the, the upselling rate actually is. Uh, they, they, uh, for, for some schools, average, average kids about in year is around six kids. Uh, and actually have some schools that who bought 70 kids in one deal. But the average is six kids for, uh, in, the, in, in, in the first year. And actually when they upsell, they take another portion of, uh, of classes to update. So uh, it's actually different from schools uh, to corporates to NGOs and the, the rate of, of how much units they upsell. But actually 70% of them, they find it good to upsell, which means that they like our product and its quality. Okay, great. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, Lauren, uh, we, we haven't allowed you any questions. So I just, I'm just going to keep quiet for a minute. But I have, I have so many questions that it's bursting on yeah, my head. No, absolutely. Let's, let's hear from the hall. 
Yes, so very quickly, because I know we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, first of all, you know, congratulations for the presentation. I thought it was, you know, very impressive. Um, I just want to know um, how quickly can you scale? That's, you know, that, that's the first question. Then I want to I, I wanna understand also, um, do you see, for example, this COVID-19, do you see it as a risk or opportunity? Um, in your in your specific market, and lastly, um, I want to understand um, in terms of uh, your target market. Okay, what is the target market now? And I, I think the question was asking for, but I, but I, I don't, you know, I'd like to understand better the answer. What's your expansion strategy into Africa? Thank you, thank you for your questions. So. First thing that you have asked is uh, regarding the uh, uh, the COVID nineteen. I, I think I missed uh, the first point. The skill. How quickly can yeah. you scale? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so actually, uh, we have been we have also uh, some plans to uh, scale. It it uh, it mainly is uh, focusing on uh, three uh, channels. The first is through indirect sales channel. Uh, through distributors, Dutch, uh, just as I said, uh, who can resell the product uh, to their uh, uh, clients. Uh, and the second part is uh, actually now affected by COVID-19, which was uh, the events and exhibitions. Because because we we our product actually can be understood, well understood when people try it or see it live, not just listen about it. Uh, they they actually don't understand it well if they just listen about it. they have to see it and try it if they can so the second part actually was the events as and, and exhibitions through uh, 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 powering these events and exhibitions with tact to be able to give an interactive experience for the audience and visitors of the events so we were uh, uh, going to offer our services for the event organizers so they can collect uh, um, a documented survey from their visitors that they can use uh, with their handwriting and a documented uh, survey that they can share with uh, their fundraising procedures next year. So actually this part is now uh, mainly affected by COVID-19. And the second uh, uh, channel is a crowdfunding campaign, as I mentioned before. And now this, this part is actually going to help us to scale very well because uh, it's not only for funding, but also as a marketing and sales uh, access. So this is briefly about uh, how we are going to scale. Uh, and also uh, for the, the COVID-19, as you mentioned, we actually, we have been working hard uh, for the uh, last weeks uh, trying to figure out how can TACT work with the B2C market. So as you can see, our product actually, uh, we have focused on the B2B clients only. But now we have been figuring out how can TACT work with the B2C market. And we have found some interesting, two interesting opportunities actually. The first is that we can use TACT to convert any table to be a graphic tablet. I don't know if you are all aware about graphic tablets. It's like a tablet without a screen that you can use to control your computer. So your eyes would be on your computer screen while your hand would be on the, this tablet to control and write and so on. So actually that can convert any table to be an, inter uh, an interactive graphic tablet, a huge one. So, people, so teachers and trainers can use it to deliver e-learning experience uh, to their attendees also with the software application that can share all these the sound and voice to the to the attendees with a two-way communication of questions and so on and so forth this actually is a part and the second one is how to use tact with children in homes in the aspect of home education and home entertainment so i can i share a, a quick video with you to to show you uh, this concept if you can uh, it's actually uh, uh, it's talking about how we can, uh, uh, how can how can children use this device doing their homework, uh, using it with educational games on tables, on, on walls, or and so on and so forth, just with bundling with different uh, components. So this is also a huge potential here in the B2C market, and that's that's why actually we are uh, we are uh, determined to launch a crowdfunding campaign because actually it would, will fit more with the B2C market. Thank you, Mohammed. We're somewhat short on time. So 
Uh, why don't you cue up that video? But I'd like to, at the same time, hear from the angels on their thoughts on, um, on this investment. Um, Mohammed, first of all, thank you for a really great presentation. And there's almost too much information for my, my brain at this time of the day. Um, you know, I started off, in fact, I was talking to Geeta this morning and I said, the problem with hardware, and this is a phrase you've heard before, the problem with hardware is that it's hard. Um, but yet I feel that what you've got is something really, really interesting. And in fact, I think Jim said, um, when can I get one? And I, I actually tried to buy one on your website. I said, can I actually buy one? Um, I'd love to see how it actually works and how easy it is to use. And is it a plug and play, etc. cetera? Um, I'm definitely interested. I think there are a lot of, lots of ideas and I, I'm sure the others are as well. Um, I, just one question. You said you're raising 400,000 um, and you've already committed 125. So there's another um, 275, but you're asking 60,000 from the nest. Is that right? So actually, the uh, our, our our round yes, it's it's four hundred thousand dollars, and our uh, main investors, the the one who have invested in us, it's called Flat Six Labs Cairo. They have a follow up fund of up to uh, 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 double the the ticket size of the uh, lead investors. So actually, yeah, our minimum ticket is sixty thousand dollars. It can be more. Uh, but this is the minimum ticket for the, for uh, for the investor, and yeah, we are also negotiating with other investors who are doing now some due diligence, and hopefully, uh, around uh, one or two weeks, we will be listening. Uh, hopefully, good news. Okay, Ita. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm interested um, in in it, and, and, and like you know. I mean, when I was listening to Raj, I think, you know, I, I need to, uh, it would have helped to, to, you know, to use the product and, and see how, how it actually works. Um, but, you know, we have interest you know, on our side. And, um, but I'd like to, to definitely do some more uh, due diligence offline. And, uh, but we, we, have, we are interested. Yeah, that, that goes for me too. Thank, thank you for you, Laurent. Gita? That goes for me three as well. Um, but part of what I would also want to have a conversation offline about is how to perhaps adjust some of the, the use of funds because R&D for something like this, the immediate application I'm seeing, if I look at it with, you know, with, with Africa as home, uh, my hat on there, is actually to see how this can be transformed into something which is more affordable and which can then go out at scale. Uh, into sub-Saharan Africa, for which some pretty big partnerships are, are important. And with everything that's happening right now with COVID-19, actually, I think this is the right time to be having this conversation. Um, I also uh, would like to explore with you offline, but this is one of for me. Thank you, Gita. I think I have uh, some interesting uh, points that we can fit into. How can this be fine and affordable versions for this product? actually to fit uh, to Africa, so thank you. Sorry, just one thing which I think is really important, which I think is the IP around it. How easy is it to copy this um, since you haven't got it? I mean, you know, I was having a discussion with someone today and, and we were talking about China and the lack of IP protection. And it's, they said that, you know, in China, there's no copyright, only the right to copy, right? So you're, 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 you're having it made in China. Can we quickly tell us about how easy is it to copy this? Okay, thank you. So actually, uh, there is two things to say here. The first one is uh, the, the thing that I have mentioned before that we are all, always having uh, some steps forward in the, in the research and development. So we can always be a step forward for the competition that even if we have recovered, we are, we are having some extra miles uh, taken. The second part is that we have our own hardware and plus a software uh, uh, design and software of our own. So that's why we are going to register an IP soon, hopefully. Uh, and the software actually is the most thing that uh, cannot be copied easily and would take a lot of time to reach. Uh, how can we deliver a good high quality of a portable solution? So there are, as I mentioned before, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, existing portable solution in the market, but actually with a very weak and low quality product, and uh, that even the, the users who have tried it, you don't buy, buy it again. And distributors who 
tried it, they don't deal with it again. So, uh, yeah. So, so uh, let me just jump in here. So first of all, from the audience, uh, Maxine pointed out that uh, you need distributors, uh, not only in Africa, but all around the world. Um, if there are people here in this, uh, in this forum that would like to introduce Mohammed to potential distributors, local business relationships, uh, please, um, you know, get in, get in touch. We'll put you in touch if necessary, and let's make that happen for Mohammed. Um, second, again, I'm not on the panel, but I would, I'm, I'm in, you know, please count me in for an investment. And, but on two conditions, two conditions. One is uh, you have to use some of that money and file that patent, patent ASAP. And two, I need, I need a unit ASAP, including your, 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 your beta, your alpha stuff. So get me one right away and I'm in. So we can talk about this afterwards, but I can probably do the 60 if, uh, or, I think Vishal had mentioned online that uh, he'd be willing to do come in on this, so perhaps um, both of us can. Thanks yeah. for this uh, yeah. words and for also this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other final comments from the angels? No, I like it. Uh, let's talk offline about how we can do this. All right. Well, thank you very much. I've uh, also launched a uh, poll for what, uh, is, what the audience thinks. And out of uh, 40 of 77 who voted, um, we have, whoops, what happened there? Oh, it just uh, closed. Um, whoop, so hold on. Okay, there it is. So we have um, several people who have indicated interest of 10000 or above and several who have indicated interest of $100,000 or above. So congratulations on a great, great results uh, with the poll, Mohammed. Everyone wants your product. So how do we order one if we want to order one? So actually, uh, we can get in contact after this uh, presentation. You have my email. And also, you can access through our, our website, and you can order uh, your unit. So, yeah. how, how long does it take for delivery, Mohammed? So actually, it, it differs according now to the, the, the customs of, of, uh, of some countries. But actually, we have stock. So once you, uh, we, you will place your order, around the uh, time for the shipping and customs, it will take. Okay. Well, fabulous. Thank you once again for a great presentation. Thank you, Gita, for uh, your, your comments and your input. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, Raj. It was great having you on the show. And I Thank hope you. to see you back again on the show. Uh, and with that, thank you again. If you are an entrepreneur and you would like to pitch on the show, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're pitching, what stage of company you're in, go to find the nest dot org apply and hopefully we'll see you on the show thanks again and we'll see you next time